Uh, take it away, Carrie. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so people are always curious about the genesis of this project. And so I just thought I would start there, do a sort of a quick intro and then pass it off to um, Alona Berger, who was the uh, DP, um, Zeph Fishlin, one of the two art directors, and Alec Dunn, who wrote the voiceover. Um, okay. So Maggots and Men started with the concept of setting a film in a definitively all-male environment and then casting it with actors from different gender expressions and bodies and thus redefining male for the audience. And I'd done this previously with Schoolboys in a short um, that was Phineas Slipped and which I completed in 2001. And I'd spent several years making Phineas Slipped. So after it was finished, everyone would always ask me next, uh, would always ask me what was next. And my friend Allison did this when I was visiting her in London. And I told her that I wanted to make a sailor movie. Uh, and I was looking for ideas and something historical, possibly. I didn't want to make anything that was light and sexy about the US military. So it needed to be set in another time and another place. And she'd heard of this island of anarchist sailors. Uh, you know, what could be dreamier? And she said, and I absolutely agreed. And what was, was sort of funny about this introduction was that was all she, in this moment, that was all she could really tell me about it. She just kind of overheard or, and so it was, it was funny that it was already mythologized and, and sort of told to me like as a rumor you know, like who were they? Were they pirates and what, what was this all about? And so I did a search and quickly found out, found um, Kronstadt and I made up my mind right away that they, whoever they were, were perfect for the movie. My imaginings were enough, but as I did the research, I got more and more involved in the actual history of Kronstadt and I'm excited by revolution and ways we can transform society. And that's my impetus for starting to make films to change people's perception of gender. And I'm influenced by anarchism and communalism, and the film was a way to engage with these ideas. Uh, the conversation above, um, the, the conversation I just mentioned with Allison took place in a squatted funeral parlor where she was living at the time. Uh, she, was, she was part of a squatting community in South London where I had a lot of really magical times and I visited it as often as I could. I wanted to move there and because I never did, I had this sort of romanticized idea of what it would be like to live in that anarchist utopia. Um, in, making, in making Maggots and Men, there was a lot of emphasis on the process of filmmaking and we prioritized the experience of being on set or in a scene. Um, we drew people from different networks, trans folks, radical queers, film people, and also through activist groups that we were part of, networks of radical left that were already quite strong in San Francisco. The politics of how we ran the set, the recruiting, the casting, all of that were important and we discussed at length. It's all non-professional actors, very few casting crew paid beyond travel expenses. Uh, we collected building materials off the Craigslist, Craigslist free section, we dug through dumpsters. We were on a tight budget. Um, we were also consciously trying to minimize our footprint by as little as possible and use things that would otherwise go to waste. And while making this movie, in a way, we created our own intentional community. Um, it took five years to make, and there were a couple of years where we were in production when it was a lifestyle. Uh, it wasn't really a typical movie set. We built a studio in Alona's backyard. Actors would do cooking shifts and build sets and um, the crew were extras. Between those shoots, we'd have Sunday night sewing parties where Flo would cook fabulous meals. We'd put people to work sewing hats and making stencils. Uh, the film really consumed us at that time. Um, and when describing the process, I have to say that there was something that felt very cosmic about what, the way all the things aligned. This is kind of hard to explain, but uh, for example, Flo felt that he had to work on maggots because of a dream that he had that connected him to the project. And he brought a real kind of magical energy there were, we, there were a lot of sort of, uncanny, uh, sort of uncanny connections to the source material and ways that aspects of the project just really fell into place. And the whole thing just felt very special. It, there was the revolutionary ideas um, and the inspiration from and our fascination with the source material. It was also this unique collaboration of trans folks and a much needed celebration of trans self-acceptance. Um, there was this, real sense of higher purpose and 
we, I think we all felt compelled for one reason or another that we had to make the film. Um, so I'll pass it off with that. I don't, alone. Do you maybe, wanna... sorry, um, Gary, do you wanna say something about Flo for folks who might not, I think you just mentioned his first name or what his role in the project? Oh yeah, Flo McGarrell and he, was um, one of the art directors. And he sort of, he moved out to uh, San Francisco to work on the film and we lived together and we, yeah, we developed a really strong friendship. He's not here now, he, he passed away in 2010. But, uh, so he's much missed in this moment. Yeah. Um, so um, I guess I'll speak a little bit about our visual influences and approach. Um, First of all, we shot the entire film on film, um, which was an amazing and maybe for me once in a lifetime experience with something of that scope. Um, everything seems like a once in a lifetime experience with that film in many ways, including just the collective aspect of it. Um, but uh, uh, Carrie and I um, watched a of course, Eisenstein, you know, which is obviously quoted in the film, but um, also a Ukrainian director, Soviet director, Dovshenko, um, who kind of had a more like lyrical, sensual um, style um, uh, in his film Earth. Um, and then um, Enthusiasm, which was um, a later film by Ziga Vertov. I believe, am I wrong? Um, I could, uh, an early an early sound film about uh, post-revolutionary orphans. Um, no, it's, it is Ziga Vertov. And then um, we also, we also watched uh, Soviet films of the Thaw era, like the um, 60s directors who often were taught by Dovchenko um, and um, and a couple of films that were like really um, important for us. Um, there was a film called The Commissar, if you're familiar with it, which is about, which um, centers, you know, a female commissar during the revolution who um, has to, has to, uh, what is, how do you say, billet, live with the, um, bunk with a Jewish family um, while she's, uh, she's pregnant and she's giving birth. And, um, and, and I recall a film called The Ascent, um, Larissa Sheptico, um, which uh, was also from that sort of 60s period and kind of had this, um, those influences of like 20 Soviet cinema, but also um, kind of the new wave influences as well. And it was very, it was very haunting and beautiful film of, tragic film about um, soldiers and civilians in a village in World War II sort of sacrificing themselves. Um, so it was an amazing education we, um, for me. And um, yeah, and just like, uh, I worked with uh, like different, very talented um, cinematographers who worked on different aspects of the shoot, like Samara Halperin and, um, yeah, I don't know if there's any specific questions. I just wanted to kind of give the the visual input. I will say we like everything that you see. We've been asked a lot if there's archival footage um, that we're using, and there's none. Everything you see on the film in the film we created, there's like a little bit of green screen, but it's all from our footage. And um, I believe we even we even have a scene where we're projecting our super eight footage on a projector <laughs> like with no with no thought of how destructive that is um in the Lenin scene so yeah it was um I'm really lucky to have worked on it um so I'll I'll, I'll stop babbling but if anyone has specific questions about um you know cinematography or visual stuff um, you can ask me and Carrie and everybody thank you um I I am the only member of the sort of primary core team who who has a, a Soviet diaspora background. And so that was interesting for me because I got to be like a, a bridge between worlds. And so I will say my, um, my uncle did a translation 
the the Russian translation for us. Um, my grandmother, my babushka, sourced um, sailor songs at her Los Angeles senior daycare. Um, when she, I never told her the the um, at the gender aspect, like of the film, and, but and she never saw the full film, but she saw she saw a short that um, Carrie put out uh, a couple of years, be- like I don't know, a few years before at. Um, what was it outfest in Frameline? And she saw the short in Los Angeles and said, wow, these sailors are a bunch of sissies. And that was really, that was, that was, that was the DVD, um, you know, comment review. I, I don't know. I don't know why Carrie hasn't used it. So that's all. Thank you for sharing. That was excellent. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alec or Zeph would like to go next? stepped in um, for the sort of second half of the shoot of the, of the film production um, to fill Flo's um, big shoes. Um, and I kind of have a visual arts background. And so was thinking about doing this for the sets and, and design kind of partly based on what had already been done and sort of partly based on kind of my own research into constructivist art of the era in making a film set that was like really kind of playing on those same ideas. So it wasn't trying to be really realistic. Um, um, and and just to speak really briefly about sort of, I mean, Carrie already talked about the community aspect of the film production, but just to say that was really what brought me in, and so many of the people that I knew who were involved in the film was really it was very much a labor of love, and very much in this sort of spirit of um, creating your own utopia, you know, making using them something that we were sort of like a a history that we didn't try to stay true to the history, we were like using the history for our own purposes. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it at that. Carrie's donning the hat, which people in the chat were asking how they can acquire those said hats. So they're oh, we, market for them. They're long gone. I think I just have one. Um, we sort of handed them all out. Or um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's also been a few years. It's been ten years now since we finished, and I've moved gotten rid of my possessions several times um i'll just follow up i have a i can talk a little bit more about influences please um i think well let's say coming into the project i had this idea of like making the film into uh like an idea of of, of approaching the film as a collage and uh flow turned me on to daisies which Mm -hmm. was very similar in that sort of approach to filmmaking uh beau travai is is um a, a film that we looked at that really came to mind when doing the the sort of exercise scenes. Corel, it makes it in, and then the windows that are um, hanging in the in the cabaret scene. Um, as far as text, the one another one is the Ida Met, and there's also um, uh, Israel Getzler. Um, there's another book that I have to mention that was very important and it's called Revolutionary Acts by Lynn Malley and that is about the Blue Blouse Theater and so the images um, the sort of tableaus that we're doing with the um, the Blue Blouse Theater are we're recreating from are just taken from photographs a a lot of the the signs that they're holding up and also the the poses um, of what they're doing um, as far as the, 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 the Dan Healy book was sort of the, the, ins- <laughs> well, one of the, 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 the Dan Healy book we found sort of later on. Um, and I think what was so important about the Dan Healy book was that it, well, sort of what we were doing is we were pushing our own ideas about Um, our own sort of fantasies about sexuality onto the film. And I mean, statistically speaking, of course, if there's a bunch of men, you know, like there were, there was homosexuality happening with sailors. I mean, that's just statistically, it's, how could it not? And, And it's just, we know that that's something that happened. But what was important that the, the Dan Healy book gave us kind of a verification um, there is, and I mean, maybe it's a little bit of a stretch, but there's a, in the book, uh, Dan Healy looks at, at rest records 
um, as well as medical records to sort of show evidence of homosexuality in revolutionary Russia. And there's one arrest that took place where there's sailors that are arrested and they're in drag and they're giving the names of uh, uh, cabaret divas. And so it doesn't specifically say that those sailors were Kronstadt, but uh, were from Kronstadt, but they were arrested in, in, in Petrograd or St. Petersburg. So that was sort of our evidence and it was really magical to find that. And um, I, we've done lots of Q, these Q and A's, but never with, with uh, Alec before. And um, so maybe I would, I, there's, so much about the the voiceover that I really love, um, and I've never I don't I don't remember if I've ever asked you this, but like the um, specifically the like the lines about the the um, revolution being like water that the sailors move through the from the the, the, um, the milk carrier. And also in the end where uh, I walked away, I would have liked to have think that I walked away with the, um, the sound of war at my back and, but all I could see was white. The, um, and I'm wondering where, do you have any inspiration for, for those, for, for that text that, that we haven't already discussed or is there, is, I've never asked you this and I'm wondering if there's things that, that you drew on that, that you'd like to share. Point really quickly to both um, Chris Marker, Agnes Varda, which were really two two huge famous or favorite. I'm sorry, I'm very tired. Filmmakers of mine, and I'm sh I know that that watching it again, just a little bit of it today, I can see the influence, especially of a Grim without a cat and Chris Marker's kind of voiceover there, of trying to kind of personalize um, some of that. And I think that the walking away thing, I was thinking of my own experiences in some riots where like. You walk, you run away like two blocks, and like mm -hmm. there's like bankers drinking coffee or something, and just that kind of dissonance of like, um, you know, of a, something that feels so surrounding, and then and then coming away. But I I just remember working on that in my basement after it was done, and I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like I wanted to um, take a moment to talk about the current situation in, in Russia um, and, and how you think that the queerness of the film helps illuminate both the history and the present. Um, we know in Russia nowadays, the lives of LGBTQ comrades are criminalized, prosecuted and, and wantonly taken. Um, and, and just maybe a, a comment on, on what's going on right now. Yeah, well, I could just say really briefly that one of the things that was really striking about making the movie is that the we we did have um, Russians, uh, work, people that had grown up and and immigrated um, to the U.S. working on the film, and in those conversations, they would they hadn't heard of the read the history, and it was something that they weren't exposed to, and um, I. I really like the idea of the movie making connections, connections between people making connections to history and queers making connections to other queers. And, and I like the idea of, the, of people, this mix of people interested in the history mixing with people that are interest, attracted to, to the queer content. Um, and I would love for it to inspire or create a sense of, of connection, I would love for it to kind of at least participate in some sort of a, a, a positive uh, movement. Um, does anyone, um, Alona? Or? Yeah, I, um, I, I think just back on the subject of hoping to, to be a bridge um, between um, LGBTI communities there. I um, I only learned um, recently that um, how how uh, one of the the drummer from the most famous Soviet rock band Kino was um, um, 
was painting or making art about sailors that was really homoerotic in the 90s um and uh what was very so it's interesting it seems like um that we're we're accessing histories that people in russia and former cis countries are also accessing and um and and you know broadly i very much support um support folks in 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 those countries that are having a really terrible time um i'm not keeping up with it enough but um but i want to but but just for me personally like i i do want to connect and 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 be a bridge i guess is what i could say thank you for sharing i'd uh, i'd like to spend the last couple of minutes here um uh, about us a little bit more time um to just um uh, get an idea of what folks are up to nowadays. Uh, what's been exciting you? What's been driving you? Any cool projects that you'd like to talk about? I uh, would love to just go around the room and uh, have that be our closeout if that's okay. 2018, I made a short um, about a, uh, it was an ACLU sponsored project and um, it's part of a series called Trans in America. And the short that I did was about a um, African-American trans woman living in Chicago that was sort of uh, getting on her feet after incarceration. And I'm uh, continuing that same project and now I'm making a feature about her. And she's, um, one of the things she's doing now is she's involved in a, a, a lawsuit against the state of Illinois um, that uh, bans felons from getting name changes. And so she's one of eight transgender plaintiffs that are trying to get the, uh, trying to uh, get those, uh, those, that law changed. And so, yeah, so that's what I'm working on now. Really quick, um, I, I just wanna give that, I think somebody in the comments asked, Said something about Guy Madden. We forgot to name check in, but but yes, yeah, shout out to Guy Madden. A huge, huge influence um, for me. And thanks for bringing up Daisy's um, Carrie. Um, I'll I run an art space in LA um, called Last Projects. Um, you can look look me up on all the social medias, and we have a site. Um, and I'm making some personal, kind of more personal essay films, and you know, it's been. I did some installation projects, like continuing um, engaging with um, family memory and like Soviet tropes, and um, and I'm working on a, a project about um, my mother and um, her affair with a cosmonaut, which is true story, but a very fictionalized um, experimental. Um, project about it um and yeah that's all thank you so much and um it's really wonderful to be on here with with all of you and thank you for for showing the film i i come out you know a visual arts background and i've been kind of moving more and more towards different socially engaged kind of projects um so i just wrapped up um like an mfa like a grad degree at, at the portland state university in art and social practice so Coming back to the Bay, I've been working on um, different projects that are figuring out ways to use the tools of art um, and to use like play and ambiguity and open-ended questions as like another like a cultural tool to address urgent times. Um, so like a playful project that I've been working on just recently is having people come up with drawings and ideas um, or different kinds of apparatuses that we can use to have like COVID safe intimacy with people we can't make pod pod negotiations work out so we've actually been like constructing some of those into actual actual objects um as an exercise of imagination and creative creative workarounds to the pandemic um and i'm also working on a, a project that's just hatching um that's like focused on wealth redistribution and economic justice and like ways to use the arts to have a an embodied and collaborative approach to forms of wealth redistribution. Um, so that's a project that's just gonna be, that I'm starting to hatch with a, a gallery in downtown Oakland called Pro Arts Commons. Uh, that's been doing a lot of, of community-based arts projects throughout the pandemic.
Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. I, I have to say I'm incredibly inspired and motivated after watching the film and hearing this panel and the great work that you folks have done. So I, I really appreciate that. Uh, Carrie, if we could close out, I, I want uh, a few people were asking about how to access the film. Um, if you wouldn't mind saying a few words on that. So I have a website that's just my name, Carrie Cronin and what? And I could, I typed it in, I put it in the chat already. And um, you can contact me through the website. And I have copies of the film on DVD. Um, and there's also a link through my website where you can stream it on video. I mean, on Vimeo, not video. On Vi <laughs> well, on video, but on Vimeo. It's that easy. Yeah. Get in touch. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gary and, and the crew. I, I really thank you. Um, yeah. And thank you for allowing us to stream the VIP film. Um, so next oh, up, we're going to have a, a panel, uh, the last panel of the two day event, Kronstadt 1921 and the social crises of 2021. Uh, we'll be streaming that momentarily. So stick around and thank you so much.